<clears throat> that sound means that the uh, Rancho Mirage City Council is convening along with the Library Board, Housing Authority Board, the City Council representing the Redevelopment Successor Agency as well. Uh, for the uh, call to order, and we'll do the flag salute first. Sarah, would you like to lead us in the uh, flag salute? A roll call, please. Council Member Kite? Here. Council Member Townsend? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Here. Council Member Smartrich? Here. Mayor Hobart? Here. Still here. He's still here. <laughs> okay, we'll go on now to uh, presentations, and Randy Binder, our city manager, will take over at this point. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. The presentation is, uh, Iris, would you like to handle that? Sure. Thank you. This is a, a presentation of, of great importance to our community. Uh, I, there's a group of people that have been working very, very hard on our Emergency Preparedness Commission, and a few people have worked very hard also on bringing safety in the form of a video uh, that was made by our Cathedral City High School, and they're going to be presenting that today. But we also have a special presentation that I think uh, Marsha will be handling to uh, a very sweet super gal who did the design for our Race to Be Ready t-shirts. And uh, we're wanting to recognize her and give her all the credit that she is due. So Marsha, why don't you go ahead with this? Thank you, um, Iris Smotrich and Mayor Hobart. Nice to see you, congratulations. And all of you, thank you so much for everything you've done for the city and particularly for our wonderful commission. So I'm gonna invite Paul up. Paul and Megan have been intimately involved with the race and this is really about the race to be ready and the t-shirt that was designed by this lovely young woman. Paul, Megan. You wanna use the mic? Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members and City Staff. I want to at this time uh, make this award to our esteemed uh, artist who created the design for this terrific uh, shirt that we had for the Race to Be Ready, helping keep people safer in the Coachella Valley and uh, moving <coughs> on to have this a safer place and with uh, your school putting a lot of support behind you. We really appreciate all that you did, and we are excited to be able to give you this award today, this $100 certificate and uh, for you, and also another $100 for your class, and this special award that will be presented by my wife, Megan. Thank you very much. Congratulations again. We have a couple of other things to do right now. Um, I'm going to invite Cyan Peruvian up. I have such wonderful commissioners, and Cyan has worked so hard on a couple of different areas. Right now, she's going to talk about her work with Cathedral City High School. Thank you, Mayor Hobart, uh, council members, and staff. It has been a labor of love, I have to say. This is the first time our commission has reached out to, high, to incorporate high school students into the emergency uh, preparedness activities. And I would like to introduce uh, the teacher, Ray, Ray Franz, who is the uh, teacher at Cathedral City High School of the Drama Department. And he's going to bring up two of his wonderful students, and they're going to show you 
a rather unique video that has an interesting beginning, and they're going to just spend a couple minutes and tell you the whys and hows of their video that they hope to share. It's not going to end today. Thank you. We can have dueling, we can have dueling videos, Cathedral <laughs> City versus Rancho Mirage High School. <laughs> I think that would be, you know, a wonderful competition um, in the spirit of, you know, school rival rivalry. Um, let me just say real quick, um, again, what an honor it has been, Mr. Mayor, city council members, staff and guests, um, for us to be included in this process. Yes, it was a labor of love. It was a great learning experience. But I have to tell you, again, the great importance that not only was stressed to us, but the realization of how important this is to all of us and our community. I just spent the weekend in Los Angeles with my in-laws and my family, and I was there for the 4.3 quake that just occurred. And immediately what came to mind was everything that we had learned through this process. And not only fear washed over me, but again, the idea of what I needed to be safe at home in this community. And I, I, I cannot tell you once we got home and once I've been through this process, the number of cases of bottled water we now have in our garage, the number of safety catches that we have applied to our doors. I have small children at home. I have basically triplets. I have five-year-olds in my house, three, um, you know, that just, uh, I think, the safety of my children and my family. Um, but. None of this would have been, you know, brought to my attention and the seriousness and importance brought to my attention without going through this process. I mean, I, I'm a Valley resident. I'm born and raised here. And I've gone through the basic earthquake disaster drills since kindergarten. The marching in and marching out, the lining up, the sitting on the playground. And of course, as a kid, you don't take that seriously. As an educator, I've been ingrained with the process and the method. And it becomes, you know, we, it becomes numb. Uh, you know, to us in general, even as an educator. But when I went through this process and was involved with Dr. Paul, uh, Dr. Maletti, Cyan, just hearing all of the information and realizing just what a reality this is to all of us, uh, it was very, very eye-opening. So I thank you for the experience. I thank you for the wake-up call and passing this along to my students, being able to passionately and wholeheartedly give this information to our students and remind them and remind all of us just how important this is because it is a reality. Today in the, new, in the LA Times, there's an article, and I urge you to read it, uh, about what a magnitude of a 7.0 or greater would do not only to the LA area, but to all of the communities affected by the fault lines. Um, it's in today's, like I said, LA Times, and it's a wonderful article. I read it this morning. Um, but again, it hits home, and it reminds us how important this is. Um, and I would urge you to listen to our students. Um, the process is just not a process. They also took it to heart, and to them, they realize you know, just how significant this is. Uh, just quickly, and I don't mean to take up so much time, um, the video will not die here. We are actually going to push for it to be included in next year's disaster preparedness uh, days that we have in October um, and be shared with all the other Valley High Schools because we feel, again, sometimes students and teachers don't take the subject matter as seriously as they need to. And with that, I'll let Edwin go ahead and, I'm sorry, our Drama Club President, Anna. Okay, hello, good afternoon. My name is Anna Karen Gonzalez. I'm the president of the Drama Club at Cathedral City High School. And Mr. Mayor and the ladies and gentlemen of the, of the Rancho Mirage City Council, I am here to thank you for having us here today. It has been a great honor to have this opportunity to be part of the Race to Be Ready, presented us by Sayan Prudian, Dr. Kopsky, and Mrs. Kopsky. Having the ability, ability to be part of a video presentation of an all of the must knows on an earthquake preparedness was informational on all things necessary. Thank, the making of this video has been a very pleasant and interesting experience for us. After concluding the project, we have been left with the knowledge that in case of an earthquake, we will truly be prepared. The greatest thing about finish a, finishing a project <laughs> such as this is leaving it with the idea that we will truly make a difference to whomever watches this video. The message we hope to portray on, on, to our audience on earthquake preparedness will most definitely be the difference between life and death. 
Thank you for all, for all your continued support, and we look forward to future opportunities and collaborations. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, and good afternoon to the ladies and gentlemen of the uh, Rancho Mirage City Council. My name is Edwin Vargas. I'm the secretary of the Cathedral City High School Drama Club. I come forth as an enthusiastic participant and supporter of this project. After much effort and perseverance, we're finally able to present you all with the finished project. Um, this project has been a very eventful process. As a group, we came together as mentors and as students in order to put, provide something worth watching. It is also something that we know will be useful to all those who watch it. We ourselves learned um, a lot through it. Many of the methods were things not thought of by us in the least. We were still stuck in the mindset of the methods we were taught as children, and that in itself is proof enough of how ill-informed our generation and the general populace is. As a participant, I am very grateful for this opportunity. It was an experience filled with productivity, energy, laughs, and all-around joy. It is definitely a wonderful project that I will always remember. Thank you for all of your continued support. We appreciate it very much. Would you like to show it now? Okay, great. Thank you so much, Sarah. In about 10 to 15 minutes, we're going to have an earthquake drill. Now, don't let the word earthquake frighten you, my child. So, can anybody tell me what it is you're supposed to do during an earthquake? I don't know, sit on the floor and scream? Nah, dude. Nah, you, you gotta be the earthquake. <laughs> now y'all go to watch a video. Do you know what to do during an earthquake? Here are four steps. Step one, <coughs> run to the nearest exit. Step two, lay down on the floor. Step three, Scream. Step four. Disregard all of that information because it is incorrect. <clears throat> That's what I get for paying 10 cents only. <clears throat> I'm sorry to disturb your resting, precious, but we're about to have an earthquake <laughs> drill! Flashlights indeed will save your life So grab it all and stash it right Make sure the fam knows where to hide Or where to meet somebody Might just get left out so so just died Could've been alright but he probably went crazy Step two is not be lazy Instruct the proper way to leave What if there's a baby? Devastate you greatly For everybody's safety Everybody's shaking When the world's shaking Step three stay calm Even if everything is breaking Shake shake nobody be racing I will eat the prank Everybody's saying Boy you tripping But I'm straight chilling When it gets real you be the king of the hell Regulate if you will Keep safe to the bills in the bank Cause it's all gone Shake 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 Have the confidence shake, No shake. earthquake can shake Shake Drop, drop cover and hold on Shake shake Shake, shake. I hope you all good. Look around and make sure. If you have a good mom, she'll get you before the personal stuff. One of the first rules of show business, young people who put that video together, <laughs> is when they play the credits, 
you um, tell them to play them a little slower, roll that a little <laughs> slower, because as long as your name is going to be up there, you want somebody to be able to see it and read it slower. <laughs> I, I think this is a wonderful um, idea that these kids have put together, and I know it'll be effective in high schools. They don't want to listen to us. They like to listen to each other, so I'm really thrilled about that. We are going to show this on Channel 17 so other people can see it that live in Rancho Mirage. Now I'd like to invite Cyan up again. You know, she, in the video, it talks about the importance of taking care of your pets, and she's worked very, very hard on this project with the city. So, Cyan? Thank you, Marcia. I would like to invite uh, to the front of the room Sandra Johnson, co-compliance manager for the city of Rancho Mirage. Sandra has no idea why she's here. <laughs> <laughs> Sandra has worked very diligently with Mike Dowry, um, who uh, was thanked officially during the uh, actual Emergency Preparedness Expo. But Sandra needs to be acknowledged on her own because she worked very tirelessly and put in long hours behind the scenes. One of the key components that she and Officer Dowry and I worked on along with Mayor Smotrich was the fact that if you know anything about animal chipping, it works very well. As long as you have phone lines and computers and a means of you scan the animal, but then you need to convey that information to whatever chipping uh, organization, such as Home Again. Uh, but if that, if you'd have no way of communicating with the chipping company, you have no way of identifying that animal. So Sandra has worked very, very hard, and I'm going to let her explain what she's. Uh, all right, I won't let her explain no, no yes. problem, yeah. no what she has done and uh, to develop the uh, pet identification card. And I am very happy to say that I submitted my dog's information and I received very beautifully presented um, my two cards from my dog with all kinds of information that will go in my wallet. And the city now has a reverse directory. Um, that I'm going to uh, let Sandra explain, but on behalf of the Emergency Preparedness Commission. Thank you, Sandra. You're welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Wow, you probably should take a moment. I'm speechless. I know that doesn't happen a lot for me, but I am. <laughs> I didn't. I had no idea. But uh, again, thank you to the mayor and city council for their support. That really is where this started, an emergency preparedness commission. And it's just about having a disaster preparedness program for animals. And what we acknowledged is that there need to be a tangible way to access information. And uh, we came up with this program in hopes to build a database that we can then print out. And in case an animal is uh, uh, dislocated from its owner that we can reunif uh, reunify them with their owner uh, in a case of emergency and that database will hold information vital to finding out who the owner is and then also if there's any medical attention that that animal may need. Um, so thank you very much for your support and a great surprise and again thank you very much. Thank you. And I have to say, it's a great model. Other cities want to have the same thing available. So here we are, Rancho Mirage, another brilliant idea. So our very last but not least, we have a presentation to make for ex-Mayor Smotrich. Iris, would you come forward, please? Megan and Paul. Isn't that gorgeous? Well, I can't say enough about Iris Smotrich and the Earthquake Preparedness Commission. She has worked so tirelessly. I mean, really, I don't know if she does anything else because she's always available to us. She's been so supportive, and it's just been absolutely wonderful. And we couldn't have accomplished what we've accomplished this year without her support. We call her our angel. And uh, this says, Superstar, Mayor Iris Smotrich. Thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you. Thank and for you. The rest of the well, I think almost everything has been said. 
Uh, this has been an incredible group of people with which to work, and we are so proud of everything they have done. And Marsha at the helm, uh, without Marsha, uh, none of this could have happened. And we are just so thrilled with the progress that has been made and the, the safety measures that people are now taking, where before they, you didn't want to think about it, but now that we're not preaching any gloom and doom, we're just preaching try to get confident, build self-confidence so that you know that when an, an occurrence happens, you'll know just what to do and, and be proud to do it. So thank you so much for everything. Just one postscript. Uh, Sandra Johnson, I uh, just want you to know my dog Rosie uh, felt that the photograph did not do her hair justice. We'll be back in for another photograph. So start working on quaffing. Okay. We now move on to non agenda public comment where people who'd like to speak on matters not on today's calendar uh, have up to three minutes to do so. I, do I have some cards? I do have some cards. Alan uh, Carvalho. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of the City Council. Mayor Hobart, I wanted to thank you for mentioning the credits on a video. This particular subject matter is very dear to my heart. I had the pleasure of working on this year's video for the Rancho Mirage a Tour of Artists' Homes. Library Director David Bryant praised my work. He sent me a wonderful review via email. His assistant, Susan Cook, did the same. All the artists involved all praised my work and my talent to interview. interview. Um, this was my second year of presenting a video for the home tour. I take pride in working behind the scenes to enhance the amazing artists featured in the video. Early this year, a friend of, uh, who you all know, the former mayor of Rancho Mirage, Mr. Scott Hines, suffered liver cancer, an unbearable diagnosis for Mr. Scott, and that together with deep chronic depression led him to tragically commit suicide. Scott was instrumental in my partner's campaign for the seat we won on the Cathedral City Council last November. We worked tirelessly, hiring Scott to help us, to guide us through the creating of the web page, the pamphlets, door hangers, handouts, the, the flyers, the yard signs. His contribution to our campaign was crucial. Scott had an amazing uh, future, was loved by many, and he remained today my personal local hero. He stood up against amazing odds. He brought the plight of the homeless to the awareness of the city and to this chamber. He and his husband, Kevin Blessing, suffered intense homophobia while raising three children. He was unfairly bashed by his political rivals when he ran and lost for city council here in Rancho Mirage. And out of love and respect, I dedicated my video, the video that I con contributed to this city, because I love video and I love what artists represent. That video that I own, the video that I was asked to produce by Rebecca Picas on behalf of the Rancho Mirage Tour of Artists' Homes, it was tampered with. The slide that dedicated my video to Mr. Scott Hines was taken out. It was removed before it was shown to the public. I never authorized that. I showed it to the entire uh, Cultural Commission with uh, Councilman Kite in presence, as well as Mr. Uh, Mr. Bryant, and nobody ever told me that they didn't like my slide. I said, well, would it be okay if I went over to the books in the library and started tearing out the pages of the books where everybody dedicates their good work to somebody they love? How is it possible that this could happen in this day and age? And did, did Mr. Bryant work alone? Is this a conspiracy? Is this homophobia? We just praise young people for doing phenomenal work. I'm thrilled about that. I work with the Cathedral City High School. I work with Rotary. I'm thrilled about the earthquake preparedness. I'm happy that this is going on. But I'm telling you, if we're not careful right now and being accountable for this kind of shenanigans and censorship and downright homophobia and hatred, I don't know where it's going to lead. I sent all of you members of city council and the mayor a copy of the letter I sent to David Bryant. I've heard nothing. Crickets. Is this what you guys and women are here for? Is to remain silent when this kind of scandal happens? I hate to say it, but this isn't over. I'm very, very upset and deeply hurt. Scott Hines' body has been flown to Colorado to be buried in his final resting place at the United States Air Force Academy tomorrow morning. And I think out of respect for a gentleman who really gave his heart and soul to the city, 
who does not deserve to be treated abusively. He's dead now. He's gone now. Do you all understand it? You can't bash somebody. He's dead. At least have the decency to allow my video to play the way it was designed to play. I did it for free, folks. I didn't ask a dime. The least you could do out of respect for me is play the entire video. I am very upset that this could happen. It was a phenomenal betrayal. I was looking forward to working next year again with the <coughs> high school students here to put another video together for the tour. I'm done. I cannot work with, with a group of people that could so easily disrespect me. No apology, no, no explanation. I did get Mr. D uh, Dustin, who works as an IT person at the library, when I went over during the showing, which I videotaped, where my slide was removed, I said, what happened to my video? David Bryan authorized him to remove the slide. Wow, interesting. Where did he get the authorization to do such a thing? It's a three second slide. It would have been forgotten by now, but it didn't get forgotten by me. I was shocked. I was there to videotape the actual event publicly to provide for archiving this city having a copy like I did last year. It was shocking to sit there and witness my slide, which had a picture of Scott Hines with Rebecca Picus, both of who were instrumental in starting the house tour last, ne last year. So I want to thank you all very much for hearing me out. I certainly hope that something is done. This may not be very, very important to the rest of you, but it sure has hurt me, seriously hurt me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cavallo. Uh, I should point out one of the reasons that you didn't hear much of anything was because of the interpretation uh, that the uh, our city attorney had on the letter and that it became then into the so-called legal category. We have by um, remote video our city attorney who is uh, uh, out, of, out of town, uh, who I think uh, will address this issue and perhaps uh, give you some explanation or insight that you haven't had yet. And um, uh, how do we get to that, Sarah? I'm, I'm here, Mr. Mayor. Can you hear me? Um, can you hear me? We need volume. Um, can, you hear me? can you hear me? Say it again. Um, can you hear me? Yes, barely. Okay. Is, is David Bryant in the room? Yes. Um, is David Bryant in the chambers? Yes. Is he yes. yes, he is. is what? Okay, I just David want him Bryan. to hear this. Too. Is he here? Yes. Um, first of all, I do not believe the city owes Mr. Carballo an apology, but I'm happy to give him an explanation. You know, last year, um, staff commissioned Alan Carballo to produce a video for the 2014 Artist Studio Tour, which Mr. Carballo incorrectly claims was a gift to the city. And I say it's incorrectly because finance has an invoice showing that Mr. Carballo was paid for his video services. So that is a lie. This year, Mr. Carballo was again commissioned to produce a video for the 2015 Artist Studio Tour. And the city will pay for his services, which again, Mr. Carballo expects. He says that in his own email that he sent to Mr. Bryant and others, including the council. So I would just want to make it clear for the record that those videos were not gifts from Mr. Carvalho, but they were considered to be what we call works for hire, which is an important legal term under these circumstances. Now, it's important to point out the fact that the videos are the property of the city. The city owns the videos. And as such, they're not forums for anyone to express their personal thoughts about personal friends and or personal political supporters. The purpose of the video that was produced this year was simply to case the 2015 Artist Studio Tour and nothing else. When staff contacted me, the city attorney, the day the video was going to be shown, and I was told that there was a personal tribute to the late Scott Hine, I advised staff to edit out that portion of the video since it was not germane to the purpose of the video. So it was me who gave that advice to city staff. Again, just want to point out the purpose of the video 
was to showcase the artist's studio tour. And it's not legal to use tax dollars, public tax dollars, for anyone to use the video for personal or political purposes, which in this case appears to be the real purpose of Mr. Carvalho's personal tribute. I mean, he just mentioned, he just mentioned today in public. And, and I actually, I guess he was just reading out of the email that he sent to um, the city council and to Mr. Bryant. But when I reviewed that email, I noticed that he explained, just like he explained in public, that his reasons were for his personal tribute to Mr. Hines was due in large part to the discounted campaign services Mr. Hines provided to Mr. Carvalho's partner during a city council campaign in Cathedral City. In his email, he states, and I quote, he, he's, this Mr. Hines, was instrumental in my partner's campaign for the seat he won on the Cathedral City Council. He worked tirelessly and hired Scott to help us to guide us through creating the web page, the pamphlets, the flyers, and the yard sign. He gave us more than we could ever pay for. And he goes on to say that, and he said it today, Mr. Hines was my personal local hero. So the point of bringing the substance of this email in light, which everybody should know is a public record, if anybody wants a copy, is to reinforce my concern as legal advisor for this city that the tribute was not germane to the purpose of the video, and there was a risk that it was really a personal and political tribute, which public tax dollars cannot be legally used for. And Mr. Um, Mr. Carvalho has admitted that's the reason for the tribute. So while some may appreciate Mr. Carvalho's desire to honor his friend, the decision to edit out his personal tribute from that public video that was shown in a public building that's going to be paid for with public tax dollars was a decision that was made based on my legal advice, which was given to protect the city's interests. Mr. Carvalho has the right to make any personal videos to honor whoever he wants, but he cannot use tax dollars to do that in this particular context. So in, with respect to Mr. Carvalho's um, public posting of charges that any city employee is homophobic, I consider that to be a very, very serious charge. And I think that the right and most decent thing for him to do is to reconsider that very serious lapse of judgment and I say, and I dare say, reckless decision, because he is basically accused a very trusted and dedicated employee of this fine city of being a criminal. In California, it is illegal to discriminate against anyone on the basis of sexual preference, which means that if anyone accuses someone of being homophobic who is in a position to hire, discipline, and fire public employee goes way beyond just plain criticism. And while I have not seen that YouTube video that he had posted about Mr. Bryant, I understand that he has, that Mr. Carvalho made that very accusation against Mr. Bryant, who incidentally was just recently attended his gay son's wedding. And that's the tragedy of this. When that video went up, David Bryant was standing by his gay son's side during his wedding. So that said, I, I hope Mr. Carvalho will consult with his conscience or with a civil attorney to, to determine what he should do under these circumstances with respect to that baseless, unjustified, and hurtful posting about any fine employee of this fine city. Because he should know, and I want him to know, that Ranch has a higher human rights campaign municipal equality index score than the city that he comes from. So that's where he should be expressing his concerns about homophobia. Thank you, uh, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Steve. Thank you. I don't know if you can hear me, but I think we've uh, got your point. And uh, uh, I would just say uh, that on behalf of the city, we are uh, unhappy that it worked out with this misunderstanding. And um, uh, it'll teach us and probably you and probably everybody else 
to be a little more certain of the arrangement terms, and hopefully this sort of thing won't happen again. But thank you for bringing it to our attention, Mr. Cavallo. I know that uh, you have uh, been personally hurt, and uh, but we have to move on. I want to thank you very much for giving me the time. It was $300 stipend that I was paid last year. I didn't ask for it. It was sent to me. $300 for $3,500 worth of work. And I thank you for the opportunity, and an apology would have been nice. This is a man that was a member of your of a mayor here in the city. Thank we you. Would not, we would not insult uh, him intentionally. You can be sure of that. I appreciate that. And I also wanted you to know that Wednesday before that was showed in public, everybody was happy. Mr. Kite was there. At that point, somebody could have said something to me. I would have been happy to edit it. When they edited my video, they diminished the quality of the work that I worked so hard on. That's what upset me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker is uh, Joseph uh, Connaughton. Oh, good afternoon, Mayor, uh, City Council members and staff. Uh, my name is Joe Connaughton, and I, uh, I live at 110 Shoreline Drive and live in the Mission Shores uh, development. Uh, I've been a Rancho Mirage resident for in excess of 10 years. I've been on various uh, uh, offices uh, of the HOA from president, treasurer, and vice president, a member. And, but I am not here to talk on behalf of the HOA. Uh, I'm here as a private individual to talk about uh, water con conservation. And I had actually hoped that we were going to discuss more uh, in terms of what Rancho Mirage was going to do for water con conservation. And um, I'm sure that in the next few weeks and months, we'll hear more and more based on whatever Coachella Valley and the state comes up with. But, but I do have a suggestion, and, and I, I would like to see that the city council, maybe, maybe uh, public works, look at, at maybe uh, instituting a ordinance or, or rule that when a new home is built, that it has a, a water recirculation device on the water heater, um, or when a house is ownership is transferred, that that be a part of the sale of the residence. The water circulation devices run anywhere from $300 to $600. The um, installation cost is less than $100. And in fact, I read an, a, a letter to the to the editor this morning who, 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 who uh, broached the same subject and said it was a very simple process to install it yourself. I would I would urge the, the city council to look at that and see if if it makes sense for us, because the three to five gallons of water that at least I think I use, you know, to get water to the back of the house so I can take a shower. Um, W could be saved. Um, for, for people to come up and say, well, you can save it in a bucket and use it again in your, in your lawn, just isn't practical. You know, I, I think a, a simple solution like this might help. Um, you might even go as far as in new residences to think about making it mandatory for a, a waterless uh, tank uh, system, which not only saves water, but a great deal of energy. If, if you look at all of the, the things that, that discuss uh, energy, of the amount of, of energy we use to, uh, to warm water, you'll find that it, it, it mounts to, depending on what you read, anywhere from 30 to 60 percent of, of the, of the uh, energy used in your home. So it, it's something to look at. I, I think it, the, the simpler one, obviously, is the water circulation device, because it, it's not very expensive. And I think if, if the, uh, the council or the city of Rancho Mirage were, say, to throw in $100 or something uh, as a rebate, uh, that might make people who are not transferring it just step in and, and, and uh, help in the water con conservation issue. Uh, I thank you for your time. I throw it out as a suggestion and hope that maybe something will come of it. And who knows, if we do it, maybe some legislator will pick it up and maybe it will become statewide. Who knows? 
But anyway, thank you for the opportunity to, to talk with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Connaughton. And those are interesting thoughts and ideas. And uh, our city manager made some notes, and we will discuss those matters. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Next speaker is a person who obscures his or her name when he or she writes it. Begins with an A. <laughs> okay. I, you know, I was late, so scribble this. I wrote it twice, so I guess you didn't see the second one. I beg your pardon. I apologize. I'm sure you read it and it's clear to you. It's just not clear to me. You sound like my mother. <laughs> so thank you for having me, and thank all of you again, Ms. Mayor, for all your time and hard work, and welcome back. I'm glad to see you. The last time I was here, you were being taken away so in an ambulance, so I'm glad to see you're healthy and whole, as we all are. Uh, today, I would like to talk about homelessness. Uh, I'm sure you all saw uh, in the Desert Sun, uh, did a small column over the weekend, because and are on the news, Monday night, and certainly Tuesday, all day and night, uh, about the forum that was held at the Mizell Senior Center. Uh, <clears throat> you'll remember several months ago, I came through in a quite you know, unhappy mood when the city of Palm Springs outlawed the homeless and with the article from the Desert Sun and reciting the hotel owners and people being concerned, running them to the north and the south, and you know, since this is the desert, the south is east. And, for the mayor, Pune, and the uh, city council not to run their problems across the desert. Well, I, I'm happy to say Monday evening's uh, forum at Mizell was quite uh, helpful and useful. And I spoke, uh, of course, and uh, used my three minutes to blast Mayor Pune and the city council for, you know, I said I'm a little confused of how they could be concerned about the homeless since they had outlawed them. And as some of you have figured out by now, uh, I am one of them. Uh, I'm exhibit A of how someone could become homeless who should never have been, which means it could happen to just about anybody, or certain, certainly a lot of people. I mean, my condominium, which is still locked up over fraud and a lien, uh, it was virtually paid for. It's the lien that got me out. And my Mercedes Benz in the accident was paid for. So, you know, who could figure that one out, right? Well, it's called fraud, and it's called malfeasance of the city of Palm Springs and a certain place over there where I was comatose, which I, you know, can't get into again. But I know that it will resolve itself soon for everyone's benefit. And what I'd like to say is the positive things that came out of Monday evening. And on the way out the door, I don't see the light, uh, uh, I spoke with Paul Lewin, and uh, Mr. Lewin was in the house. Uh, he wasn't up front, but because I, I pretty much let Jenny Fote have it, because my Scottish Terriers were sitting there, and she tried to throw us out. And I said, well, we're not leaving. She said, no, you have to leave. I said, we're not leaving. I said, you made us homeless, and we got nowhere to go. OK. Oh, I made you homeless? I said, yeah, you uh, and everybody up there. So of course, this is what I reiterated when I spoke. I said, you made me homeless because you turned down every single demand that I put on the city for malfeasance and for police brutality. And with all of this godforsaken stuff going on around the country, you know, who should be brutalized by a cop in the year 2013 in front of the city council meeting? Well, that would be me. OK? And the cop didn't want me talking about it. And this article, or letter to the editor in the Desert Sun, which I saw this morning, reiterates the words on the top of the city council, the people are the city. Well, it, you know, I know that it's coming to that, because Paul Lewin apologized to me. He apologized to me and to my family for every single felonious crime having been blown off up the string. I got every bad cop, and there are good cops over there, because one yesterday impounded my dogs and impounded me. I woke up this morning to banning jail. So, you know, the greatest, biggest thing in the energy that came out of that, and I came away with it not expecting to be arrested yesterday, but um, I knew it was coming sooner or later, be at the wrong place at the wrong time. But anyway, um, the other people that spoke, and I know I'm not crazy, one, there's one person, one society, and in my 
church. There's one God, one mind, and one man. And I've said this about the desert from the moment I arrived. It's one big desert. We all love it. We're in love with this desert. But I said here at this meeting before, it's one big desert. It makes up one big city with big city crime. And we cannot have a missing link over there in Palm Springs with the corruption of the city. So I know that it's being healed. And I, I know that. Mrs. Eddy talks about it. I've quoted her here before about what she says about discerning the rule of law. So I know that it's, it's coming full circle. So I want to thank you, all of you, for allowing me to exercise my free speech. I will say in my last moment, quite disappointed with the Desert Sun. It was supposed to be a new day, according to Greg Burton. Well, no such thing for me. They've decided to violate my First Amendment right. They don't want to hear any of my uh, story with regard to the city or anything else. So that's too bad for each and every one of you. So the biggest thing that came out of Monday night was one thing, and that's coming together and being one and healing this thing called homelessness. I should never have become homeless. So thank you. I know it's going to heal itself soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on something that's not on today's agenda? Seeing that, uh, Mr. Uh, Returneth, Mr. Conagher. Notice that I have, I have no financial interest in any shape or form to the suggestions I made about purchasing equipment. Uh, we were thinking or otherwise. It. We were saying, ah, the guy's okay. hiding something. I just thought I'd bring that Thank up. you, Mr. Conagher. Okay, we'll move on to the next item, and that's City Council uh, board member comments. Uh, Richard, anything? Uh, nothing today, Dana. And how about Iris? I, I Yes, I did want to uh, just comment about a happening that is going to be taking place at our Rancho Mirage Library, and it's going to take place Wednesday, May 20th at 7 p.m., and it's the Steinway Society bringing music to children. Uh, this is the Society of Riverside County as it presents the winners of the 11th Annual Festival Competition in Concert, and the winners range in age from 7 to 17 years, and according to the D D Desert Sun, the Steinway Society Society is the only organization providing comprehensive synergistic music education programs throughout the school year in the 40 Coachella Valley schools. Uh, their educational programs include classics, concerts in schools, piano labs, ukulele labs, and more. And how nice that they're bringing back the ukulele. <laughs> Can't what a hardly fun wait. Thing. Anyway, so if you have some time and you want to spend a fun evening, go to the library and enjoy the Steinway Society as they bring music to our children. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. Charles? No, sir. I have nothing right now. Did? Yeah, just uh, I want to show you a couple of overheads on the progress that's uh, been made at um, the Rancho Los Palmas Shopping Center. That's a, a picture of the Steinmart uh, building that previously was Vaughn's Market, coming along extremely well. Uh, construction is going on. They anticipate uh, actually opening sometime around uh, late summer. So um, uh, if you drive by there, you will see that uh, it's a transformation in, in progress. The actual groundbreaking for the new CVS pharmacy will be uh, May 11th. So that's going to be a, uh, a very exciting day. Uh, the center will be literally look brand new by the time it's finished. And uh, we'll continue to show you progress uh, uh, as, it, uh, as the construction comes close to being finalized. Thank you. Ted, are, are they Thank doing you. new fascia on the whole uh, plaza? Yes, the the entire uh, plaza will have a uh, a new uniform look. Great. Thanks for bringing those. Okay, moving on to the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of April 16th? So I'll moved. make a motion. Please vote. Too slow, Charlie. You did second it, didn't you, Charlie? I did. Council Member Smartridge. <coughs> Council Member Smartridge, could you test? Thank you. 
It was a complicated process. I mean, these are the minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the minutes are approved. Uh, find a zip. Uh, we'll move now to the consent calendar. Randy, what's that all about? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. You have eight items on your consent calendar today. First one is to waive full reading of the ordinances that are in the consent calendar. Second item on consent is final acceptance of the Highway 111 Frank Sinatra Drive improvements. This project constructed additional left turn lanes for both westbound Frank Sinatra and eastbound Highway 111 at the intersection of 111 and Frank Sinatra. It increased the capacity of the intersection and improved the safety. The improvements were constructed by TriStar Contracting and were within budget. They were inspected by staff and the improvements are in, in accordance with the contract documents. Uh, the construction budget, you'll re recall, was $1.3 million, and the project came in $32,000 under budget. Uh, of this uh, $1.3 million budget, $900,000 is reimbursed by the Federal Highway Safety Improvement Program for the majority of our costs. And thank you very much to Bill Enos, our city engineer, for um, handling that project from start to finish. Item number three on consent is a notice of acceptance for the 111 Median Island Landscape Rehabilitation Project, City <coughs> Project 12-275. You're looking at photographs of it now. This project consists of uh, re-landscaping Highway 111 in the Median Island from Paxton Road to Bob Hope Drive, a total distance of 1.5 miles. The improvements included replacing the old water intensive shrubs with new drought tolerant design, as well as the installation of a new water efficient drip irrigation system, new cobblestones, boulders, and other granite similar to the themes that are used uh, elsewhere on the Median Islands and Rancho Mirage. These improvements were performed by Golden Valley Construction. They've also been inspected by staff or in compliance with the project plans and specifications. Uh, the project was funded through the Recognized obligation payment schedule, the ROPS program, and the project cost was $361,000. These improvements will reduce water consumption for the medians by 80% and will reduce landscape uh, maintenance costs roughly by 15% per year. Thank you to Randy Viegas, our Public Works Project Manager, for handling that project. Item number four is a notice of acceptance for Parkview Villas roofing project. This project was headed by Sean Smith, our economic development and housing manager. These consisted of roof improvements and repairs at the affordable housing projects. There are photos in your packet. The project cost was $99,000 and was spent from housing bond proceeds. Item number five is a consideration of funding request by the American Cancer Society. The Special Assistance Fund Subcommittee, consisting of Mayor Pro Tem, Ted, Pro Tem Ted Weil and Councilwoman Iris Smotridge, requested that this item be placed on the agenda for consideration. They are recommending $5,000 from the SAF Discretionary Fund. We have about a half dozen city employees signed up for the Relay for Life event that will be held on May 29, 2015. Sandra Johnson is heading up that team, and we expect more to be signed up in the future. Item number six is the quarterly treasurer's report. Thank you, Isaiah, for putting that together for me. Item number seven are contracts, and number eight are demands, and we are here to answer any questions. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, anybody want to pull any item? I'd like to pull number five. <clears throat> Can we have a motion with respect to the remaining items? Whoops, never mind. Let's see if anybody from the audience would like to pull anything or discuss any of these items. Seeing none now, we'll move on then. Is there a motion to approve the remaining portion of the consent calendar beyond item number five? So I so move. Moved and seconded. Please vote. Motion carries unanimously. Richard, uh, what is it about item five you'd like to mention or talk about? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to have Sandra Johnson come down and talk to us a little bit more about the event. Come on down. She better apologize to my dog, Rosie. My, my dog's picture came out great. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's because yours is a male. Mine's a female. Sandra has been heading up the, this race over the last few years, and it's one of the major fundraisers for the city staff. So could you give us a little bit more detail? Uh, this will be our third year um, participating in the race. Um, this year there were some logistical challenges as they moved the race to the high school. 
So it gave the, a little bit behind the scenes in the start. So that's why it's such a short window of uh, fundraising this year. Um, so we're excited about moving to the new high school. Um, uh, the employees are participating as they have been in the past. And our goal is to not only meet your contribution, but exceed that. So. We're hopeful that we can do that. We have a great group of uh, staff members that are going to join in on the fund, so hope you'll come out. What's the timing on that? Uh, it's May 29th. It's a Friday. Um, part of the reason we changed it to that was so that the weekends can be preserved because we found that, that was, uh, there was some pushback for people having to give up their weekends to participate. We also shortened the race this year. It's not a 24-hour. It's actually a 6-hour from 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. It'll encompass the traditional opening ceremony and the luminaria ceremony. But we thought it'd be kind of fun to have it on a Friday night uh, in the gym, so it'll be air conditioned if it's a warm evening. Um, and we're just trying something new to see if we can get more people to participate. So it will be inside rather than on the track? Yes, inside the uh, gym at uh, Rancho Mirage. Okay. Thanks for your hard work. You're welcome. Is that it? And I, I'll get you, you that picture, Mayor, sooner <laughs> rather than later. Please, Rosie, okay. I'll appreciate it. Richard, is there a motion? I move that uh, we approve the expenditure of 5000 from the Special Assistance Discretionary Fund for the Relay for Life. I'll second that. Motion is seconded. Please vote. <clears throat> well, I know the motion carried. 5-0. Uh, there we go. Forget all that. Passed 5-0. We'll now move to the public hearing. Item number 9. Randy, who are you going to have to talk about that? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll turn this over to Bud Kopp, our planning manager. Thank you, Mr. Binder. Good afternoon. Uh, Mayor Hobart, members of the council. Over the past several years, staff has received numer numerous requests from homeowners and developers in private, ga private gated communities to place security walls slightly closer to the street in order to increase privacy and the amount of usable private open space area within their lot. Although their request may be approved by their individual homeowners association, the city's, the city's requirements are often more restrictive. Under our existing code, which was adopted in 2002, a maximum six foot high fence or wall may be located anywhere on a parcel except within the required front yard setback, street side setback, or s traffic safety site area. In these areas, the maximum height of a wall is 36 inches. The only exception to this rule is when swimming pools are located within a front yard. In that case, a four foot high wall would be permitted and wall may encroach up to five feet into the required setback, resulting in a 20 foot setback to that wall. This has sometimes resulted in an awkward transition between property line walls and front yards. Uh, due to the number of inquiries that uh, planning has received from residents, staff has evaluated this request and agrees that this section of the code related to security wall placement and height needs to be streamlined and less complicated. This proposed zoning text amendment is strictly related to the permitted setback and height of walls in private gated communities on private streets and within homeowner associations. If approved, this ordinance would allow the city to approve a six foot high wall or fence, a minimum of 10 feet from the front property line, but only within gated private communities subject to homeowner association guidelines and approval. To decrease the visual impact of the height of the wall in relation to the street, a one foot high berm or planter is required to be installed so that the wall would appear no taller than five feet as seen from the private street. Uh, as shown on the screen, this is a good example of berming in Clancy Lane Estates that gives the appearance of a five foot high wall as seen from the private street with attractive landscaping in front. In order to promote vehicle safety, vehicle access gates will still be required to be set back at least 17 feet from the front property line so vehicles can pull out of the travel lane to safely activate the gate. For homes on public streets within non-gated communities and developments not associated with homeowners association provisions, no changes to the code are proposed. We've received four letters of support for the proposed ordinance amendment, uh, including Toll Brothers, Future Vision Homes, Sterling Pacific Development, and Ken Bernard. 
we've received no letters of opposition to the proposed amendment. During our agency consultation, we did receive a letter from the Imperial Irrigation District stating that walls must be at least three feet away from pull boxes, vaults, and transformer pads to allow servicing of this equipment by their personnel. Developers must show these utilities on their grading plans prior to permit issuance, and they'll work with the district when placing walls abutting the IID facilities. Attached in your staff report is also the city attorney's independent analysis and a review of the municipal code reveals no internal consistent inconsistencies which would hinder the enactment of this minor amendment. And the city attorney's independent analysis recommends that the proposed amendment is consistent with the general powers and purposes of the city. The proposed amendment is also exempt from CEQA pursuant to section 15305, which is minor alteration in land use limitations. In conclusion, this proposed amendment only applies to properties within gated communities on private streets that are subject to homeowner association requirements. It allows the individual homeowner association to determine whether or not a six foot high wall placed at least 10 feet from the private street is appropriate for their neighborhood. If a homeowner's association determines that it is acceptable, it could be approved by staff. All proposed walls and fencing will still need to comply with the city's community design element of the general plan in regard to architectural quality. And on April 9th, the Planning Commission <coughs> held a public hearing to consider this proposed amendment. During the public hearing, no members of the public spoke concerning this application. The Planning Commission recommends approval of the proposed amendment and categorical exemption based on the findings and content in the attached staff report. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Wasn't uh, one of the objectives that this would apply to custom homes inside of gated communities, not really production homes? I mean, mass produced homes. Isn't that, uh, wasn't that the tenor of where we were headed on this? The way that it's currently written is it would apply to, uh, to homes within private, within gated communities on private streets that have homeowners associations. Now, that could be interpreted to apply to several semi-custom or per perhaps production unit, you, uh, unit homes, uh, but if the intent strictly is to have it apply in custom home communities, we can certainly amend the ordinance to make that clear. I think that should be. Can you go back, uh, sir, to that photograph on Clancy Lane, the first of the houses with the white wall? The second of the photographs, maybe. Not that one. Yes, that one. <coughs> Uh, Randy, would you explain uh, what happened one day when we went out there and what the issue was? Sure. There was a, this was a um, pie-shaped lot where the front property line, if you will, is curved. It's a uh, three-quarter to one-acre size lot. It's a custom home. So the swimming pool is between the home and the wall, meaning um, it's facing southwest. So the view is out towards the southwest. This wall is basically their backyard wall. So if we would have required the standard 25 or 17 foot setback, it would have put uh, all of the landscape area, the non-usable area outside the wall and left very little land inside the wall for active uh, amenities for the homeowner. That This was something that I approved and that's when I asked Bud to go ahead and uh, direct an amendment to the code and there's a couple of others, the other one that he showed and then there's another one that we did on um, Vista Dunes. So you? those are custom homes, and I, that was my intent, at least, in the ZTA, was to right. apply to custom homes, not to, not to production homes, whether gated or non-gated. If that's the desire of the council, we can certainly clarify in the ordinance. Um, I'm not sure if it... If, uh, we, we, could could make, over, we, we could put it over to the next <clears throat> meeting if... Uh, that makes sense, um, unless there's some exigent circumstance. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what the protocol is, if the council m would make a motion on the ordinance amendment to, inc to clarify that this be only applicable in custom home communities, we could make the ordinance amendment and bring it back for second reading that way. Okay, without objection? 
I just have a question yeah. to the city manager. Randy, what was the distance between the wall and the property line? There? I believe it was 10 or 12 feet in that case. <clears throat> as opposed to? As opposed to the requirement of, I believe the normal is 20, 20 25. The or normal without a swimming pool is 25 feet. If you have a swimming pool, it, you're allowed to be up to 20 feet. So that wall would have set way inside right. of where it shows right. now. Right. So okay. all of that land would have been on the outside of the wall. Mm -hmm. You had an outside pool? Yes. Outside that we pool. could all use if we could get over the fence. <laughs> yes. uh, Dana, that I have a situation that happened at the Mission Point. Now, that's a production neighborhood that was built in the right. 90s. So but we matter. did have a couple who came to the board and wanted to build and close their front, and it was murder. So I certainly agree that in production, they shouldn't have that right. opportunity. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to discuss this matter before we put it over to uh, a subsequent meeting? Seeing no one, then I, without objection, we'll, I so move. we'll uh, continue it. Uh, well, or we can just what, bring it back at the next meeting? Well, what, I was, what Bud suggested I think was a good idea, and that is go ahead and approve it with the caveat that this apply to custom homes only, and we will make that change. And then when the second reading comes back before you at your next meeting, We'll verify that the language is correct. Okay. Is that acceptable? Motion it's then a minor change. to approve then? Right. Yes. Moved and seconded down yes. here um, to approve the change that it will be brought back to us uh, for clarification and edification. Good. Any further discussion on it? Please vote. Motion carries unanimously. We move on to number 10. Randy, who's taking this one? My glasses on and I can read it. Well, I'll tell you, it's Gloria Griego. <laughs> I think it's okay. Gloria. And she's <laughs> just taken seat. Gloria? Mayor, City Council, this is a modification to the Special Assistance Funds guidelines and authorization given to the City Manager to waive insurance requirements for the contract for services with recommendation of the City Attorney. The SAF program has been in existence since 1990, and we've made m several modifications over the years. We are once again making modifications before the beginning of the new fiscal year. The first modification that we are going to make is to make the guidelines more consistent with the process. Currently, we have the application online, however, the guidelines do not stipulate that. They state that we will mail the application, which um, will now be made consistent. The second modification is to the discretionary fund section of the guidelines. We typically have them write a letter to request for an application. However, since the application is already online, they are able to just download it and submit it directly to me without submitting a letter first. The third modification is to the contract for services. For nonprofits that receive an award of over $5,000, they are um, required to enter into a contract for services, which contains insurance requirements that sometimes the nonprofit is not able to comply with. With that being said, what we are doing is we are adding a provision to the contract for services to authorize the city manager to waive all insurance requirements with the recommendation of the city attorney. And that concludes the modifications. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to Gloria, answer. Gloria, I have a question regarding the filing of the application. What is the uh, date now required for filing that we have it here? For the regular SAF program, we begin accepting applications immediately after the budget is approved. So we would start sometime in July, and we would issue a press release to let the public know and the nonprofits know. We would also have the application process open for 30 days thereafter. That information will be on the city's website. Thank you. Any other questions of uh, Ms. Griego? Anybody in the audience like to discuss the matter? Seeing none, we'll close the public session. Um, I think we can make just one motion, and I'll do it if you want me to, just for ease. 
Uh, I would move that we make the three uh, modifications in the ordinance as shown on page 10-2 and 10-3 of the report in which appears in the um, uh, Special Assistance Funds Policies and Procedures booklet at page 10-19 and 10-20. Uh, if there's no objection, I'll move that all three amendments be accepted and added and modifying the current language. Second. Moved and second. Any further discussion? Second. All in favor, please vote yes. All opposed, please vote no. Motion carries unanimously, five zip. Move to item number 11. Is this a Bruce Harry matter, uh, Mr. City Manager? Yes. Bruce? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, in our efforts to continue reducing energy and take advantage of state and utility company energy incentives and rebates, uh, staff is recommending two energy retrofit projects. The first recommended project will convert all the city's street light fixtures from 200 watt high pressure sodium vapor to energy efficient LED technology. All 50 of the city's signalized intersections are targeted by this project <coughs> and an energy savings of nearly 50% can be achieved with this simple conversion. In addition, a $40,000 rebate from Southern California Edison is helping to fund these improvements. The second recommended project encompasses multiple city-owned properties, those being City Hall, San Jacinto Villas, Parkview Villas, and Whispering Waters, which are housing authority properties. The City Hall scope of work includes the replacement of two City Hall boilers, which are used to provide space heating for City Hall and the council chambers. Specifically, the project scope consists of replacing two plus, two 20 plus year old inefficient boilers and replacing them with a single ultra high efficient condensing boiler. The scope of work at the city's housing properties consists of replacing pool and spa recirculating pumps with energy efficient variable speed pump technology and installing occupancy sensor thermostats in the clubhouses. In November of 2012, the California Public Utilities Commission made a decision to authorize two regional energy networks that would be independently administered by local governments during the 2013 through 2015 energy efficiency funding cycle. One of these regional energy networks, the Southern California Regional Energy Network, administered by the County of Los Angeles, provides energy efficiency services to public agencies throughout Southern California. These include all the territories covered by Southern California Edison and Southern California Gas Company. Under contract to Los Angeles County, the Energy Coalition designed and implemented a pilot program called the Energy Efficient, the Energy Network Public Agency Program to address critical public agency energy efficiency gaps and barriers with a comprehensive suite of services delivered through a collaborative approach. Oh, yeah. The program serves as a one-stop resource to help agencies implement lighting, mechanical, street lighting, water, and wastewater energy retrofit projects that achieve, that achieve deeper energy savings. The program services provide at no cost to the, to the local agency include project management, uh, cooperative design analysis, audits, performance specifications, construction management support, and financial analysis. The Energy Network offers California public agencies the opportunity to procure energy efficient improvement projects on an expedited construction schedule through the use of pre-qualified and competitively bid <coughs> contractor pools experienced in per performing energy efficiency projects. The Energy Network's partnership with National Joint Powers Alliance, which is called the NJPA, delivers access to this form of procurement to public agencies. The NJPA is a public agency with legal authority to serve as a contracting agency for municipalities and other public agencies in all states, including California. The NJPA, which the city is currently a member, conducts an open, transparent, and competitive bidding process in accordance with the California Government Code for electrical and mechanical energy efficiency contractors to work through the energy network supported projects. In July of 2014, the City Council adopted an ordinance amending Chapter 3.34 of the Ranch Manager Municipal Code, allowing shared agency purchases in place of 
project-specific bidding, in other words, piggybacking type contracts. The City of Rancho Mirage, by being an NJPA member, has access to these contracts and can make use of the contractors by exercising the Joint Powers Act and the provisions of Ordinance 1083. In Ordinance 1083, there is a requirement that the Director of Public Works, with the consent of the City Manager, make findings with respect to entering into piggyback contracts with another governmental agency. Those findings are identified on uh, page 11-3 of the staff report. JPAs are similar to the piggyback concept where one city piggybacks with another city's contract. <clears throat> this is generally acceptable because one, competitive bid procedures have already been utilized by the first agency and the second city is getting the same or better pricing. The NJPA competitively bid multiple construction contracts on behalf of the energy network. In this way, the NJPA stands as a lead and sponsor agency holding master contracts with the qualified contractors. Funding for the two proposed projects are currently budgeted and appropriated by the City Council for this year's current budget that we're in. They include the LED street lighting retrofit, the City Hall, Hall boiler project, and the three housing projects which are handled through the recognized obligation payment schedule. All these projects will be receiving rebates and the rebates will be given back to the city at the completion of the projects. Staff is recommending that the two contracts be awarded, the first to uh, ABM Electrical Lighting Solutions Incorporated for the street lighting retrofit and the second contract to MCOR Services Mesa Energy Systems for the replacement of the city hall boilers and the work to be done at the housing agency projects regarding the swimming pool pumps and the occupancy thermostats. That concludes my presentation, and I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you, Bruce. Um, it seems to me this is the first one that we've uh, made purchases under the NJPA. And um, so far, so good as far as you're concerned? Yeah, we went out and we've actually um, got quotes on replacing our boilers and things, and these prices are cheaper than what we were able to acquire if we went out uh, separately. We got uh, quotes right. from two other mechanical contractors. So there is a definitely a advantage to piggybacking on these types of contracts. Hey, well, it's nice to see something that saves us money and saves us time, a lot of time. Absolutely. Definitely. And also the design was free of charge. They came in and did all the design for us. They did all the calculations, all the energy audits. Everything was free through the program. Wow, super. Any questions of uh, staff? Anybody in the audience like to say anything on this subject? Uh, why don't we have two motions? Let's award these contracts separately. Is there a motion to approve the first contract? I'll make a motion to approve the first contract. Do you want me to read the motion? Yes, Mr. please. <clears throat> the first motion will be the award of contract to ABM Electrical and Lighting Solutions, Inc., in the amount of $120,053 for the replacement of 188 high-pressure sodium vapor city-owned streetlights with LED Street lights. There a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Please vote. <clears throat> Motion carries. Go ahead, if you would, uh, Mr. Weil. Mayor the, Pro Tem. Thank you for the correct title. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to avoid a whipping. Yeah. <clears throat> the second motion will be the award of contract to MCOR, E M C O R <clears throat> Services. Mesa Energy Systems in the amount of $149,801.66 for the removal of the two 20-year-old City Hall natural gas boilers and replace them with a single high-energy, efficient national natural gas <laughs> condensate boiler and replace swimming pool pumps with variable speed energy efficient pool pumps and replace swimming pool house thermostats with occupancy sensor thermostats at Parkview Villas, Whispering Waters, and San Jacinto Villas. We have a second. Second. Seconded by uh, Councilman Townsend. Please vote. Motion carries. Both motions carry uh, unanimously. <clears throat> Moving on uh, to the last item on the regular agenda, uh, Mr. Uh, Binder, what's this about? Thank you, Madam, Madam Mayor. 
No offense. No offense. Well, that's, that, that's what the name Dana will get you, actually. <laughs> it's a hard habit to break. It is. It is. <laughs> All right. So, as everybody is uh, very aware, the city of Rancho Mirage, led by Mayor Hobart and the CV Link subcommittee, which also includes Councilman Kite, uh, with the support of key staff members, including our finance director, Isaiah Hagerman, and our public works director, Bruce Harry. Uh, this group has raised significant questions regarding the operation and maintenance scheme of the CV Link project. Operation and maintenance, the O&M issue was addressed in detail in Ma Mayor Hobart's memo to the CVAG Executive Committee on April 27th, and you all have uh, read this comprehensive document along with 18 exhibits that are inside of it. The questions of long-term O&M and how it will be funded and who will pay for it, these questions are ongoing and they have not been resolved as far as the city of Rancho Mirage is concerned and I would hope that other cities would be concerned as well. So if not for the important objections raised by Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Ted Weil at his CVAG Transportation Subcommittee on May 4th, the master plan and the maintenance scheme may have been approved and potentially forced upon the city. O&M is one important issue that needs to be resolved as part of the CV link. The other one, and the, uh, and the subject of today, is the physical location of the link. So today, Mr. Mayor, the, today's discussion would focus on the physical location of the link in a couple of areas. This item would build upon the city council's decision at your last meeting which prohibited the CV link from destroying the character of the Butler Abrams Trail. Council also voted at the time to disallow the CV link from disrupting the Rancho Mirage Library grounds and using the city's land and displacing the very location of the observatory project that we're all working hard to launch. Today's question is, today's request I should say, is that the council consider a motion to take this a step further to prohibit the route of the CV link along any portion or across any portion of Highway 111 or Bob Hope Drive within the city of Rancho Mirage. I think I mentioned at the last meeting we all wish that this project could be built entirely within the Whitewater Channel from one end of the city to the other. Uh, if it was empty and vacant like it is in some other cities that would be much easier to do. But the city of Rancho Mirage is mostly built out in the Whitewater River Channel there's few segments, if any at all, that are devoid of any other land uses. What we found in analyzing this project in depth is that the route through Rancho Mirage, because of the issues with the Whitewater River Channel, would be so circuitous and disruptive that it seems like every alternative location brings a whole new set of problems for the community. And at your last meeting, and probably today, you'll also hear some more comments from the community on this. In our opinion, allowing the CV link to cross Highway 111 at multiple crosswalks is not safe. It would compromise the safety of the street, and it would also compromise the capacity of Highway 111, which is our major thoroughfare. The cities and CVAG have spent considerable sums to synchronize the traffic signals on Highway 111. The CV link would disrupt, totally disrupt the signal synchronization plan frustrate drivers, clog the streets with backed up traffic. Same thing would happen on Bob Hope Drive. Sim similarly, access to our business districts would also be impacted. Imagine trying to enter or exit a driveway from a street with a 50 mile per hour speed limit while trying to dodge people and bikes and skateboards and neighborhood electric vehicles and who knows what else is in front of you. So at this point in time, I feel that city should provide clear direction to the CV Link project team that Highway 111 and Bob Hope Drive should be off limits. My recommendation, Mr. Mayor, is on page 12-1 of your packet. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Randy. Any questions of Randy? Randy, Randy, just uh, one question regarding the, uh, the, the length of the restriction on Bob Hope and Highway 111. What are the boundaries on that? The city. Just city the limits. city boundaries on Bob Hope also? Right. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, we'll turn to the audience. We have two requests, uh, formal requests to speak. Mary Jane Phyllis? Phyllis? Phyllis Navidad. Which is it, Phyllis or Phyllis? Oh, it's got to be Phyllis. It's Phyllis. Ah, good. <laughs> 
Okay. My name is Mary Jane Felice, and I live in Thunderbird Cove. And good afternoon to all of you and Mayor. So I am here to hope that we do not allow the link through our beautiful city. Speaking of that, Mike, more directly, and your hopes will be closer to being heard. I'm maybe hoping answered. that we don't allow the link through our city. I am not aware of what the Rancho Mirage Planning Department, what their a view is of it, but I do think that good planning doesn't mix high speed, high volume vehicular traffic with pedestrian traffic, and that's what we're asking for. Doesn't make sense to me. I don't see how it works. Secondly, I, I don't think that, I'm hoping that our mayor and council won't let the pressure of our sister cities influence a good decision for our city. Because I think Rancho Mirage can only be negatively impacted by allowing it. We're unusual, we're special, and I hope we can keep it that way. So my last point is, I would just like to know how, and you could maybe let me know, how do you see this benefiting any of our residents, residents of Rancho Mirage? I, I don't see it as a positive. I don't know how it could benefit any of us. I think well, the, the answer that would be given to you by somebody who uh, would be arguing in favor of the CV link would be it gives you the opportunity to um, get on your bicycle, your golf cart, your electric vehicle up to a speed limit of 25 miles per hour, um, your dog on a leash, and to use one of those modes, including your feet, to get you to Palm Desert and even get you down to Indio or Coachella. Well, I understand that. I do walk my dog, and I do use all of the walks and stuff. And if I want to go to Coachella, I'm going to drive. <laughs> Thank oh, you. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Get real. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Felice. Miss Felice. Uh, the next uh, speaker is uh, Mike Fontana. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, um, I'm really here uh, today to give you a big thank you for taking such a strong leadership role and being so courageous to recognize that uh, CV Link, um, from a high level uh, perspective is a great idea, uh, but you've had the courage um, to, to look at this from a local perspective and determine that it's a bad fit as proposed in our community. I wanna thank you for that. Um, I, I also wanna thank you especially, uh, Mayor Hobart, um, for your courageous act uh, of uh, bringing this to the attention of the CVAG Executive Committee. Uh, I did attend that meeting. It's the first CVAG Executive Committee meeting that I attended. And, and I came away um, with a notion, uh, w whether it's true or not, I came away with the notion that, that there were probably, um, there was probably one person in the room on the Executive Committee that actually has read the almost 500 page master plan, and that was uh, Mayor Hobart. And uh, against, um, I would say, uh, a, a less than hospitable crowd uh, at the executive committee, Mayor Hobart did an excellent job of making not only the case for the city, the Rancho Mirage, but the case for all the cities that um, we need to look at the flaws that are contained within CV Link to make it better. Okay, and we've exposed some of the flaws in Rancho Mirage, and I think now we need to call out the other cities to do the same type, give this thing the same type of scrutiny, so that if it goes forward, it's the best that it can possibly be. Now, I, I, I wanna take this opportunity to do one more thing, um, just one. Um, I've been to several of the presentations that CVAG has done uh, directly and with their consultants. And in those presentations, and we read and we hear about the presentations, we hear the word path, and we hear the word trail, okay? And, and, and I don't know what your imagination is like, but when I hear path and trail, I'm thinking something that's kind of private and quiet and tranquil and secluded. 
And, and I will tell you right now, and it's really hard to find because it's in those 400 and some odd pages of that master plan, it's only in there once, okay? And it's on, I believe, page 28. And it calls this, if you'll uh, allow me to just take one moment. Yeah, it's on page 28. You can all go look for it. It says, quote, CV Link is a transportation corridor like any other roadway, not a trail, end quote. And that's really what it is. Uh, we have uh, a, a, a road that varies in width that extends from one end of the valley to the other um, that, that is proposed to average 24 feet wide um, and, and will probably, I would guess, be recognized in the CVAG Master Transportation Plan as a roadway. And, and quite honestly, uh, and I'm from the Butler Abrams neighborhood uh, where we have a tranquil little trail um, that's used by many walking their dogs and other things. Um, it's, 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 it's a treasure that deserves to be protected and I applaud you for your aggressive efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fontana. <clears throat> Is there anybody else in the audience who'd like to discuss the subject? Yes, sir. Well, that's how, I, how you look every time I see you. <laughs> I, I just want to lend my support to the people who already spoke. I'm vehemently opposed to this because I, I, I just don't see the necessity. I don't see any benefit to the community. And from my personal experience in a city that recently burned down, Baltimore, they did a similar type project there, and it became a magnet for crime. It actually closed down one of the big regional malls in a very, very high-end neighborhood because of the crime that was attracted by the easy access from various neighborhoods in, into those that parts of the city. So I'm just opposed to it on general principles and in my own experience. And, and if it's got to come through, if they can't fly over the city of Rancho Mirage, maybe keep it to the other side of the 10, It'd be a, uh, you know, consider that route. So I just want to lend my support. And I think I speak for a lot of the people in Rancho Mirage. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Anybody else like to speak? Seeing none, we'll close the public session. Um, let me tell you that um, Mr. Fontana mentioned the executive committee meeting that was um, about two and a half weeks ago or so now. And uh, I did. Uh, make a lengthy presentation. I had written a 12-page brief, and uh, we had assembled 18 exhibits in the book, and uh, I got through most of it uh, by the time uh, they'd uh, heard enough uh, from me. And um, uh, a couple of days later, I got a call from the executive director, Tom Kirk, who asked uh, me to meet with him for coffee one morning, and we did, uh, the next day or two. And uh, at that meeting, we discussed uh, our various perspectives of the CV Link and the issues that remain to be resolved. The problem, as I see it, is those in charge of development and design of this project are continuing full steam ahead. Uh, I asked them to slow down. I didn't say stop. I just said slow down. Try reducing the amount of money being spent for these various modalities of preparation for the eventual construction. And uh, let us save that money until we know for sure the project is going to go forward. I said there are certain issues that have to be resolved. And the biggest issue, of course, was who is going to pay for the operations and maintenance charges. CV Link, in their documents, page 15 in the same booklet that Mr. Fontana was referring to, they designate a projected operations and maintenance expense of $1.6 million in the first year of full operation. So we're talking maybe three years out, something like that. In that first year, $1.6 million. Obviously, costs will go up uh, as long as that is there, and it would probably be there for 100 years. The method of paying for that $1.6 million was recommended and was about to be voted at the Transportation Committee meeting 
uh, just uh, right around that same time, just a few days before, a week or so before the uh, executive committee meeting, uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, uh, Weil it, it chairs that meeting. And on the agenda for that meeting, like I said, about two weeks before the executive committee meeting, is the recommendation for final approval of the entire plan, including the funding part. The funding part, that went, how are we going to pay the $1.8 million, $6 million uh, on the first year and thereafter whatever price increase that may be, was presented to the Transportation Committee for recommended approval without it ever having been discussed except on March 30th, just a few days before that, the executive director, Mr. Kirk, came to City Hall and he met with uh, our CV Link committee and uh, Randy Binder and one other member of staff, as I recall, I think our finance director, and told us for the first time, this was March 30th, what we were told for the first time that the method that they were recommending and about to vote at the first votes, they would take several votes, but it would eventually get to the executive committee within that month, was that this, this was the formula. You would set 2016 next year as the base year. Each year thereafter, you would take the difference, the increase in TOT that you receive, TOT receipts that the city receives, 8% of the difference between each year, in this case, it would be 2017, 8% of the difference of the excess over what was the, the rate in 2016. So if 2016 chart looks like this and 2017 chart looks like this, you take 8% of that difference. The next year, it goes up here, you're still taking 8%, but at this time, it's of all of this distance. It always goes back to 2016. And so that in the third year, it comes up, this stays the same, but it's 8% of this difference. Our finance director, following the exact same formula and format, making the exact same financial assumptions that CVAG projects for the CV link, concluded that in year nine, we would be paying for that year alone $313,000 of our TOT money, our transient occupancy bed tax money. That's nine years out. We're now up from the first year, projected at 28,000. It's now up to 313,000 and going up in much greater proportions as we get further away from the base year. That surprised, that's not the word, shocked, uh, stupefied all of us when we heard these numbers and the formula. Now, the fact of the matter is, of the nine Coachella Valley cities that would be paying these charges, five of them would be paying probably over 90 percent because uh, one, one of the cities doesn't even have transient occupancy taxes because they don't have a hotel. Uh, others have very small TOT income, so they're down here. But La Quinta, starting at La Quinta, uh, Palm Desert, Indian Wells, Rancho Mirage, and Palm Springs, those are the cities that would pay, essentially pay, or virtually all of the operations and maintenance expense if it had passed uh, going in long into the future. So when I met with Mr. C uh, Mr. Uh, Kirk, the executive director, uh, for coffee a few days after the executive committee meeting when I made roughly the same remarks that I'm making now. We met and I, th I thought that we had agreed. Apparently we didn't. I've learned since that we, uh, I misinterpreted what I thought was his agreement. But my position was this, and, we, and I tried to sell this to him as being the reasonable, rational approach. 
CVAG is, had taken the position that of that $1.6 million, the cities wouldn't have to pay the whole thing, that a third or so of it would be paid through Measure A funds. Now, Measure A was a, ma a countywide measure voted in 2002 to extend a 1.5% increase in our sales tax on all items in the county for the single purpose of repairing our wretched roads that were in horrible shape. You can imagine how people saw the condition of the roads. How many times do you see a sales tax countywide get passed? A half percent, which is a significant jump. You virtually never see it anymore. But our county passed it. Now, those funds accumulate. And they accumulate under the aegis of the um, uh, CVAG. CVAG uses those funds, those Measure A funds, to repair roads, to build new roads, to relieve congested intersections, unsafe intersections, to redesign them, things of that nature. All of the projects that are under consideration are entered in a book called TPPS. I'll just call it the TIPS book. It contains 247 items of road repairs, freeway repairs necessary that we're going to spend our Measure A funds on. 247 are on the list now. Rancho Mirage has seven. Uh, Cathedral City has 35 or 36. Coachella, 35 or 36. Every city's got some. CVAG, however, on this CV link is saying, well, we can cut the O&M expense to the cities by taking money out of the Measure A funds. So I said to uh, Mr. Kirk, first, let's find out if it's legal to do that, because the requirements built in to the ordinance that governs these expenditures uh, is pretty tight, and it says the money can only be spent on arterial roadways. The CV link plan is for the executive committee to designate the CV link, this 50 miles going from Palm Springs to Coachella, to designate it, guess what? Yes, a regional roadway. Hey, and now that it's been designated by the official body, we can use it. I said to Mr. Uh, Kirk, I said, well, it may or may not be legal. We do need a legal opinion coming out of Los Angeles, not locally where we know all the lawyers, but out of L.A. from a major firm. It'll cost us a few bucks, but they also have insurance to back up their word if they make a mistake. So we need that. He said, well, eventually, I thought we had agreement on that. Maybe we didn't, but I still think we need it. Second, I said, even if it's legal, each city should consider the issue separately or all of us jointly to determine, is that something that we think we should use Measure A funds for? Should we take money out of our roadway repair funds in order to build this pathway, roadway, trail, they use all kinds of words for it. It's 30 feet wide for the most part, 30 feet wide with uh, golf carts, electric vehicles, joggers, walkers, dogs on leashes, babies in wagons, has to be ADA approved. Uh, all of this traffic, if there is traffic on it, if it gets used that much, and that's an open question, I suspect. But at any rate, do we want to use Measure A funds for that, that purpose? I said, that's something we should decide while you slow down the progress and uh, let us get answers to those questions. The other question I said, we have to know also is the $1.6 million a reliable estimate? If it is, fine. If it's not, we should have an outside organization survey it to determine if the O&M expense of 1.6 is fairly accurate or if it's not. Because we want to know what is the burden that will be imposed on the cities if this were to be passed. 
we had agreement on that. And he said, that's will be that'll be the first thing that we do. He said, we'll we'll examine that. I said, well, it doesn't have to be the first thing. The first thing should be getting a legal opinion. No, we'll get this first. He said, we'll get we'll get the O&M uh, number down straight. I said, but wait a second. It doesn't matter what the number is. If you're going to go to a law firm, you're going to only ask about the principle. Is this legal or is it not legal, regardless of how much the number is? We've CBAG has now spent this entire month hiring new people, continuing to play their vid videos uh, on television for what it's going to look like majestically someday down the road. They're still spending the money full full blown when we have asked them just to slow down a little bit. But what they've done is they have taken the Transportation Committee meeting of a week or so ago and they had four or five people come in not an expert in them, not a one of them had any connection with a, uh, a pathway such as this where they had vehicles and all on it. They had some photographs of trails and nice bucolic scenes, but nothing comparable to this. Took two and a half hours of the time in front of the trans Transportation uh, Committee. It's now set for Monday, next Monday, uh, in front of the Coachella Valley Safety Committee, of which a uh, former mayor and councilwoman Iris Smotrich is on. They've got it listed as on the agenda for that meeting. It'll be the same people coming in. And believe me, if you've got nothing better to do to see whether I'm giving you a snow job or not, go go to that meeting it's at the CVAG headquarters in Palm Desert and decide for yourself as to how convincing the, the people are with respect to whether or not our 1.6 million is a fair and reasonable estimate. Then the TAC, the uh, Technical Advisory Committee of CVAG, consists of the uh, city managers. They have a meeting next week or soon thereafter. They have a meeting coming up. And guess what they have on their agenda? Their agenda is also going to talk about is, is this a reasonable $1.6 million estimate? And it'll take up two hours of their times, too, if they bring the same people. All of this delay, in my view, keeps the money moving toward this project, keeps it moving like a snowball going down a hill, getting bigger and bigger and faster and faster to a point where somebody may at some point say, well, we can't stop now. Look how much we have invested in this thing. And I've been trying to slow them down, and uh, they've been uh, hitting me fairly hard, uh, uh, several people. Uh, but that's okay. As I said to one of those persons, I said, I have an obligation, as does every member of this council, we have a fiduciary duty to the residents of Rancho Mirage to fight for what we think is right, no matter how you look at us. And literally, that's what it's come down to. And that's where it is at the moment. We're still fighting to try to slow it down. We're tr try to get. We're trying to put together a big meeting of all cities at one time, so there's no separate, conquer and divide kind of thing, where all cities have at least five representatives, including their city managers, finance director, public works directors, and at least two members of the council present, so we can all hear what each other thinks about it. Because even the cities that don't have much in the way of TOT, they also have the most severe budgetary uh, cramps, if you will. And so for them to take their lesser amount and pay it off to the CV link hurts them proportionally probably more than it hurts any of the five cities that pay the higher amount. So they're put in a pinch. In other words, TOT is not the answer to funding it. And if it is not the answer, the question is, what is the answer? And you damn well had better come up with it now, sooner than later. And that's the problem. We can't, we haven't so far been able to slow this moving train down. And I urge all of you listening on TV, watching on TV here today, think of ways you can, what you can do to get this thing to just slow down. And let's find out if the cities want to pay the use Measure A funds, because if they don't, then the burden goes from 1 million to the full 1.6 million, which will make it a lot tougher. So how are they going to fund the 1.6 at that point? 
We've got to have answers to these. We want to know if it's legal. We want to know if we should use that money. And then if everything works out and everybody's in love with the CV link, fine. Let the cities that want it have it. Let all of the cities try to find appropriate routes. We've worked with them for two years to try to find appropriate routes. But we have been having to eliminate those routes, as we did two of them today, because it would just be simply too disruptive to the lifestyle and the course of flow of traffic within our city. So we're still looking. We're still keeping an open mind, because maybe they'll find a way to fund it, in which case our, our views become focused on the reality. But right now, we're wasting money by keeping this thing moving like a roaring train going downhill or a snowball going downhill. And uh, that's the update that I wanted to give you. And I certainly support the motion to eliminate these two streets uh, that we're talking about, uh, Highway 111. Uh, you can't have vehicles turning left or right into residence areas or businesses and having to cross a 20 or 30 feet of CV link of pedestrians going both ways, dogs going both ways, people going both ways. It's insanity. And so we're saying, no, we can't use these. And so we're saying to them, keep looking. If you can find something that's acceptable to us, fine, we'll seriously consider it. We don't want to be naysayers. We don't want to be naysayers. But sometimes boondoggles are defeated by naysayers. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well, I, I, I'm, I'm sure I've left a lot unsaid. Uh, Iris, would you care to uh, say anything? No, I, not at this time. I think you've uh, really identified a lot of the issues and uh, brought people up to date as to what has been going on uh, with the uh, progress you, we've tried to make, and you have spearheaded so much of the conversation, and we are very thankful to you. Richard? <coughs> Dana, thanks for bringing us up to date. I'm sure the, the public uh, now has a better understanding of the direction we're going. I think it's really important for Rancho Mirage to stand up and say, hey, we are different from the other cities that are involved in the, in the LINK project. If you go back and if you looked at an aerial view of the, of the <coughs> CV LINK from Coachella to Desert Hot Springs, you'll find that there is hardly a city that the CV link goes through where it does not disrupt or it, it does disrupt the, the business district like uh, Rancho Mirage. Uh, if you look at the other cities, in most cases, the CV link is proposed for way outside of the actual downtown city. Unlike Rancho Mirage, we don't have a whole lot of choices. And as the mayor has pointed out, to try mm -hmm. and put the CV link down Highway 111 uh, would just be a disaster for businesses, would be a disaster for re the residents in the area. And I think we've got to recommend to CV link and CVAG that they try and find another alternative if and when they come up with the funding for the whole process. I think uh, the, the districts or the uh, highway area that uh, the CV link will go down in Rancho Mirage is just unacceptable for all of us. And uh, I don't think the other cities have that same issue. So they're more willing to continue this project going ahead because they don't see the detriment to their community that we have here in Rancho Mirage. So I definitely support the motion and uh, look forward to working with uh, with CVAC in the future to find some alternative route uh, to make this work, if it will, and if we can pay for it. Thank, Thank you, you, Richard. Charlie, anything you well, want to you know, add? You, you've really covered it all. There's not much more to say, but I will say that the um, citizens of Ranch Mirage should be very proud that you have a council and you have Dana Hobart who is looking at this because well, you're, you're, all you're, listen to what you're saying. You're, I've waited long enough. I've waited so you could finish it. You're out of order. <laughs> <laughs> but I really mean that, uh, that we really do take into consideration. We have a beautiful city, and uh, we don't want it destroyed. And as you heard everything, and all you out there are shaking your heads, yes. And we hear you, and Dana has heard you. And I just hope that uh, it comes to a... Um, 
conclusion that will be beneficial for the other cities and maybe hopefully we will find some way in Rancho Mirage for it to uh, also be part of it. If it doesn't, then we'll have to address that when that happens. But thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, Ted. In uh, sitting in on all of these meetings, <clears throat> it, uh, I think Mr. Fontana said something appropriate, that you hear these tranquil tones like path and trail. You think of something very peaceful. Um, what's being presented is not peaceful. It basically is a street. It's a concrete 30 foot wide pavement to accommodate electric vehicles, golf carts, runners, joggers, bikers, etc. Frankly, not a real compatible group. When we looked at a lot of the pictures, frankly, we saw and it was pointed out that bicyclists and runners were the prime motivation. And if we could find something that accommodates, again, a more of a peaceful setting, we would certainly be open to it. But that is secondary to how it's going to be paid for. And our entire mantra, as Mayor Hobart said, is how can we obligate our residents to a cost that's unknown now and into the future? The answer is we cannot and will not under the present circumstances. And that is our, our pledge to you, and we expect in every waking moment to fulfill it. Thank you, Ted. Iris, you said you had a little something? Uh, just as an, uh, one note that um, a lot of people forget about sometimes, and you touched on briefly as far as the safety aspect of this, because it does go far beyond the uh, financial aspect. You know, we're, they're planning for, as they use the word that I've heard a couple times, momentous amount of traffic going to be using this uh, pathway, roadway, trail, whatever they call it. And when you put together uh, motor vehicles, um, golf carts, runners, walkers, strollers, mothers pushing strollers, little children tagging along, uh, bicycles, um, roller skaters, skateboarders, you're looking for a major hazard when it comes to people's safety. I know even when, if you're familiar with Venice Beach and a few of the other boardwalks where people gather together for a nice easy day of outdoor uh, strolling or walking, um, it's almost like playing dodgem. Uh, this is bumper cars and it's, it's accidents waiting to happen. It's catastrophes possibly waiting to happen. And on Monday, I will be addressing this at the CVAG meeting. And uh, if there are people, as Dana said, who would like to come and, and see the meeting, uh, it's certainly open <coughs> to the public. But, but the safety aspect of this, this roadway is a great concern to a great many people, and it has to be addressed, and it has to be taken care of before this can be moved forward. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. Okay, the motion was made by uh, me and seconded by Richard. Uh, uh, please vote. All in favor of the motion, vote aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. We're now uh, finished with the um, main agenda. We don't have a lawyer here to take us anywhere. Do we have anything in closed session? Uh, well, we have two items on the agenda, but... Uh... <coughs> there were two things on the agenda. Yeah, that'll, that will end up being assumed by the cities. That would be assumed by the cities. They don't have that in their It's not in their budget. It's not in their budget. Right. Right, right. It stays in our budget. Do we need to? Yes. Yes. Uh, Sean Smith is telling us we do need to go into closed session, Mr. Okay. Mayor. Okay, then, uh, and that is because we are going to consider, here, give me that, and I'll just read it, or you can read it. Conference with the legal counsel, existing litigation, uh, 
Veronica Juarez et al. versus City of Ranch Mirage, Riverside County Superior Court and conference with the legal counsel regarding potential initiation of one potential litigation case. Thank you. We're in recess.